Red Ray Gun Limited presents The Benji and Nick Show. Red Ray Gun Limited presents <laughs> dun, dun, The Benji dun, and Nick dun, Show. Dun, 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 dun. Except she didn't join in. There's no what? What? Except there's no Benji today. <laughs> He's still got it's on the internet. It's the Shelly and Nick show. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, no internet. Yeah, Benji uh, moved uh, and yeah. doesn't have any internet. So yeah, he nearly had internet. Oh, just to explain, <laughs> yeah. But you know, British Telecom sent his router by first class mail, which means, of course, if you live in the UK, you'll know it means. It doesn't arrive. <laughs> <laughs> so the engineer had nothing to plug in, I believe. So, no. so that's it. Um, so, uh, I mean, you've heard the beginning of the podcast. I have before. heard the Shelley beginning of the Dean podcast. normally joins us about halfway through to talk about the topic of the day. Um, but for those of you who, who've never encountered the Benji and Nick show before, um, we normally start with the Loch Ness game, which isn't uh, about Loch Ness and isn't a game. Do you want to give that a go? Sure. And then I'm we talk game. about cult vintage television, just yes. in case you didn't know. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good day. Good afternoon. Good point. Good night. Good tidings. Goodness. Loch Ness. Oh, See? oh, my first time. She's good at it. Uh, uh, uh. She's good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a sore winner. Look at that. <laughs> Uh, and what we'll be talking about later is... We are going to be discussing Cracker, the UK version, because apparently I found out there was an American version wow. as well. I didn't know that. I didn't either. And I oh. couldn't get it to watch it, so I can't even make the comparison. So. Oh. Well, um, well, we can talk a little bit about that later, even though yes. neither of us know anything about that. But we've certainly yes. seen the first story of the UK one, although knowing Shelley, she's probably watched the entire series. The entire first series, yes. Okay. <laughs> well done. Um, but before all that, uh, again, Benji and I usually go through the emails sent to podcast at nicholasbriggs.com. And uh, do you, um, shall I? Uh, yes, I'm going to start off reading them, aren't I, if I just yes. locate them? Uh, okay, here's one from uh, Adam Turnbull. Uh, and it was sent on the 15th of June in the year 1741. A great year. Very good uh, year. And the subject is capital R, capital E. Does that mean religious education? I've no idea. <laughs> uh, it certainly does. I think seem... that's just re, like yes. regarding. <laughs> the subject is regarding. <laughs> Why not? Um, he says, just wondered if you thought about talking about the Omega Factor. Very dated in special effects, but has some cracking, creepy stories. With Doctor Who's Louise Jameson on good form as usual. And it is very much like an English X-Files. Um, Shelley, what's your reaction to that email? I like the thought of the idea of that because I love the X Files. So, but I've not, I mean, I've heard of it and I've seen it, you know, in around on internet searches and things like that, but I don't know anything about it. Oh, yeah, it is good. And um, Big Finish got the rights to do it. And so we've done it as audio drama with Louise reprising the role oh, as an okay. old character. Um, yeah, That's so convenient. And, and I, I, and I, <laughs> loved working on i did the music for it oh okay and uh, i loved working on it. i thought it was amazing um but um what what's the story what what's it about well it's well it's about paranormal investigation really yeah so i'm just my doors waggling in the wind ah, um waggling in the wind it's not a euphemism <laughs> um yeah it's 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 set in scotland and was filmed in scotland and it wasn't that long after louise had been in doctor who as leela and uh, she plays a, you know, really smart uh, scientist mm -hmm. who's very sceptical about all this stuff. But slowly it becomes clear that there are darker powers under the surface. Ooh. I mean, I think you'd like the story I, content. You said paranormal. You had yeah. me at paranormal. <laughs> so, but it's, yeah. very, it's very much like all that 70s television in the UK that we've made you watch. It's multi-camera. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm getting a text. Who's no, that from? It's not me. No. Uh, <laughs> I better look at it, otherwise it'll keep dinging throughout the entire podcast. And now I'm going to put everything on. This is Benji taught me to do this because I'm old and stupid. I've now put it on Do Not Disturb. Oh, <laughs> it's a big deal, Briggs. I just uh, I just turn my volume off. That's what I do. Oh. Mine seems to not worry about that and keeps um. pinging away. But uh, write in if you understand iPhones because I don't. 
Um, yeah. So it's it's very much that kind of multi-camera. In fact, I think they did all the location stuff on video as well. So it looks kind of so it doesn't look expensive. Okay, I was going to say, how does the how is the budget? Like, are are there like monsters that you can see the zippers or? <laughs> No, it doesn't get that. Um, there are no monsters. Oh, okay. It's all very much, you know, psychological and weird stuff happens. And there are some special effects, but it's okay. um, it, it it kind of feels like an an adult version of Doctor Who from that time. Okay, mixed yeah. in with a little X Files, which was in the future at that time. So. Exactly, but yeah, you can. Um, so when the X Files came along, I thought, oh yeah, this is a little bit like a, a stylish version of the Omega Factor. And I love that how you guys pronounce it. We would say Omega. Of course you would. Yes. Well, some people do in this country. <laughs> Omega, 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 yeah, that's Omega. How, that's how they. Omega, as some people say. O- Omega, Omega, yeah. But yeah, no, I'll have to check that out. Now, def- definitely have to uh, listen to the big finish ones. It's very good, yes. Yeah, um, do you want to read exciting. the next email? Yeah, so we've got another email, and this one's from Mark Crozer, and it came in on the 14th of June in the year of 1347. Don't know why that year. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Greetings, Nick, Benji, and Shelley. Very much enjoyed the Red Dwarf episode last week. I agree with you both that Backwards as a standalone episode was not nearly, Nick and Shelley, as funny as it could have been. The rest of season three is brilliant, though, as is seasons four and five and some of six. My favorite episode is probably Dimension Jump from season four, in which alternate reality Rimmer, a heroic, good-looking pilot and thus a total opposite of Red Dwarf's Rimmer, Rimmer, saves the day. I haven't seen any of the Dave series, and I'm not sure I want to as well. Aren't they all getting on a bit now? (laughs) Not sure how the aging process would fit in with a character who's an android and one who's a hologram and therefore should be unaffected by aging. Oh, picky, picky. Yes. Talking of Red Dwarf has reminded me of the BBC's attempt at another sci-fi comedy around 15 years ago called Hyperdrive. Have any of you seen it? Question mark. I it's, have. You have. It starred Nick Frost, Kevin Eldon, and a pre-fame Miranda Hart. I don't remember anything about it other than that it wasn't very good, which is odd as both Nick Frost and Kevin Eldon are usually very funny. Keep up the good work. Best wishes, Mark. Ah, well, that's interesting. Did you... Hyperdrive. I'm making a note of that as well, because I do love Nick Frost. Yeah, I mean, I think... Well, let's let's deal with Red Dwarf first. Yes. Um, have you seen the episode where uh, Rimmer, there's an alternative version of Rimmer who's heroic? No, I have not gotten up that far yet. Uh, d- I, um, I saw the alternate, uh, obviously the one where it's a woman. Yes. Yes. No, this is where he's, he says, was it um, something has smoked me a kibber for breakfast? And he's terribly heroic and uh, utterly <laughs> adorable. You know what I mean? And really nice. And I think it was just a way of giving Chris Barry, who plays Rimmer, you know, uh, something uh, less annoying to play for for a while that's fun now yeah i'm i'm working my way that that was uh he said that was up season 4 so yeah i'm i'm still in the beginning of season 3 cuz i had some cracker to watch and those were very long so i have put red dwarf on the back burner i don't know what the character was called we'll have to look that up won't we i wonder whether I can do a Benji and, and do some internet looking up. I can do it. Can, we can let's have a race. Uh, <laughs> alternative Rima in red. Oh, red dwarf. I'm going to write. What does it say? Oh yeah, yeah. Arnold Ace Judas Rimmer was a heroic and dashing test pilot in the Space Corps on Mimas. He's an alternate dimension counterpart of Arnold J. Rimmer. Yes. Oh, and he's very handsome with his... He's got this fancy hairdo. Yeah. There we go. Very cool. Yeah, I can't wait to get to that. And Hyperdrive. Yes, Yes. I have seen it. I've got a funny feeling they might have made more than one series of it. I have TV series. Oh... It was yeah. 12 episodes. Yeah, two oh. seasons. Yeah. I mean, it was, I, everyone said it was terrible, I remember. 
But I, I'm, you know, a, a bit weird, and I quite enjoyed it. And I've got it on DVD, actually. It yeah. says on the 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 DVD cover, shockingly good, like The Office set in outer space. Well, there you go. <laughs> so there are a lot of great sci-fi jokes in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, yeah, and Kevin. I mean, you know Nick Frost. You don't know Kevin Eldon, presumably. No, not and you by don't name. Know Oh, I do. Hart. I know Miranda Hart. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. So she was. Yes, yeah, she hadn't done much at this point. Kevin Eldon has done a. He's more of the comedian's comedian. He's not really famous um, uh, to even people in the UK, but he turns up in a lot of stuff. You've got your Benji and Nick mug. If you're watching the video, if you're not watching the video, if you're watching the video, you can see it. If you're not watching the video, I'll post a still. Yes, I got my Benji and Nick show mug that I am Mine's drinking in the my kitchen back beverage in the house. from. No, I made sure to bring it because the whole point of it was to <laughs> do this. I on know. The Why did I forget? We all opted for the same mug. You realize that we didn't. We all went for the blue one. I think I'm the one who said we might as well do blue. It'll look prettier on the video. Well, I just liked it. Yeah. 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 But anyway, um, so yeah, hyperdrive. Uh, oh, Kevin Eldon. I'll tell you something about Kevin Eldon, who you don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he was auditioning to get a place at my drama school when I was in the third year. Okay. And I, if you sort of drew the short straw, you had to help out on audition days as a third year. And so I think all my productions were over with and they said, you know, come and help out. And so I was just sort of escorting prisoners to yes. execution. With clipboard, Nick with a clipboard name, rank, serial number. Like... Yeah, I could totally see it. And Kevin Eldon was one of those people. Oh. Uh, he, he won't remember me, I'm sure. But uh, if I ever get to work with him, I will remind him. If you're he... listening to this, Kevin, please let Nick know you remember him. <laughs> he <laughs> imagine. <laughs> They asked him in the audition what he thought was funny, and he described. Uh, he said, "Oh well, I described a, a, a sketch about. T well, he said, I I said two guys hitting each other with enormous fishes, um, and that and that comes from a Monty Python sketch I was just where, they, say, where they do a dance very, and they go yeah. and they're touching each other with fish, and then the other one produces an enormous one and whacks him, and he falls off the side into the sea, and it's just nonsense. I think it's done to the sort of tune of some Highland fling. And I remember <laughs> thinking that's funny, but none of those people in there would have got that. Yeah, but he got in. So, oh, yeah. nice! And became sort of famous and successful. I think he's a really good actor. Hyperdrive. Yeah, we must look into that. Actually, yeah. I think you. I think the thing with Hyperdrive, like Red Dwarf, you have to kind of get into it and sort of mm -hmm. start to like the characters, and then it becomes interesting. And like Red Dwarf, it's also quite fun if you like science fiction as well. You know, right. it's it's not. It's it's been written by people who've watched a lot of sci-fi TV. Right. And it's it doesn't take itself too seriously, probably. Like it's not like no, mm, no, looking it, down their nose and Oh no, no, yeah. it's, yes. It's yes. It's played entirely for laughs. I think there is a laughter track like Red Dwarf. I think okay. I'm pretty certain. Maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? On to the next email. Yes. Uh, this is called The Hidden Side of Mike Gambit. Does that tell you anything? No. <laughs> no. Mike <laughs> Gambit is the third character introduced in the final series of the avengers oh okay uh, uh, the the new avengers it was called and joanna lumley became the sort of the the sidekick woman mm -hmm. and they, but they introduced a, a sidekick man because by then patrick mcnee who played steed as you remember mm -hmm. was quite old and they thought well he won't be able to handle all the the kicking and shooting and stuff so anyway so that's who mike Campbell is okay. and this was sent on the 14th of june in the year 1558 by Kenneth Mann, one of our favourite contributors. Kenneth says, I have recently acquired the ability to play Blu-ray discs. Late to the party, I know. It only happened to me about a year ago, to be <laughs> frank. Actually, slightly less than a year. It's weird, isn't it? And, and have found the extraordinary detail it provides almost distracting from the drama. I find myself hypnotised. Were the coffee mugs in the Department S office really from Habitat? Goodness me, there used to be a Woolworths on Oxford Street. Most revelatory of all, I discovered that the uppermost LP on the pile of records in Mike Gambit's apartment is Radioactivity by Kraftwerk. Uh, 
goodness. Uh, of course, this may just be a set dresser's joke, given that the episode was the last of the Cybernauts. Uh, possibly. But I prefer to think that Gambit has a taste for electronica that he keeps to himself. I now see his character in a different light. And in any case, the Man Machine album was not released until two years later. So if it is a robot joke, it is very a very prescient one. I wonder what wonders or horrors the future may hold. Certainly, episode one of The Persuaders features a shirt-bandana combo that I would hesitate to see in its full remastered high-definition <laughs> glory. I would be unsurprised to find that the Ipcress visual effect used to torture Michael Caine was created purely by zooming in and out of one of Roger Moore's more vivid shirts. Have you no, ever seen the Ipcress no. files? No. <laughs> The Express file is a, a, a seminal British um, uh, spy movie from 1966 with Michael Caine. Okay. Really cemented Michael Caine's fame. He'd he'd become famous for being in Zulu and um, Alfie, I think. And the Express file was like, yeah. And they, he did three. Uh, the character he played was Harry Palmer, uh, a spy uh, uh, based on a series of novels by Len Dayton. Um, yeah, I'm a mine of information, aren't I? <laughs> uh, have you had any high definition revelations of this sort, or are these things for which the world is not yet ready? Uh, regards Kenneth Mann, so close to Elstree that some of his car trips have rear projected film backgrounds, really. <laughs> um, have you ever noticed things on high definition that you'd never noticed before? I don't have, I don't watch anything on Blu ray. I don't have a, I mean, I think. We have a Blu-ray player, but I don't know. And I don't have cable. And I know that there are some cable here in America. There are like 800 cable channels now, 400 which are regular. And then the other 400 are those same exact channels, but in high def. Uh -huh. um, so, and I don't watch regular TV enough to, to experience that. But I do understand, you know, I, I have experienced that with watching remastered Move, you know, like when they re-release -re something that they've remastered and they've, you know, upped the quality and stuff. And that always yeah. is, just as an example, like Star Wars, I know that from the original to what somebody would watch now, apples and oranges as far as the quality of, of yeah. the CGI yeah. and all that stuff. But, um, but I, I mean, I guess just in over the years, as far as the quality of film and what you watch on on TV is is you you see more flaws in people, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of their faces, and you know. I know. I don't see why it's necessary, and I have to say, you know, having worked in high definition television, they spend all their time putting smoke on set to fuzz up the image yeah. to make it yeah. less defined. So I really, I don't know. It's just one of those things. People are obsessed with high quality images, but I just, I'm not sure how necessary is i know many people who think completely the opposite and say oh god have you seen so and so they've they've upscaled it and i think i don't want to see the sellotape on davros's neck or right. whatever right. you know yeah. i just don't want to see it it's like yeah. in space 1999 you can in the first episode you know apparently you can see the fingerprints uh, on the side of the console before they grab it because obviously it's the second take you know yeah so i don't i yeah I think yeah. Lisa Bauman said, I'm sick and tired of seeing the hair follicles on people's noses. Well, that's the thing is you've got, you know, I don't remember what was we were watching, but every I think it was Star Trek. I think it was when we were doing uh, the Star Trek episode that every time they switched, did a close up of somebody, it was just like. It was as if you were looking through a, p a piece of glass with Vaseline over it. The filter was so intense on mm. certain actors. It was like, oh, come on. You know, and so now that's well, it was just, usually women, though, wasn't it? I think but also uh, Dr. McCoy, though. Yeah, they, but I can't remember exactly who it was, but it wasn't just the women. It was one of the male actors as well. And it was just yeah, like, oh, come on. I but think it's now, anyone who they thought looked old. Right. So but now now that everything is shot in high def. You know, you've got these filters and, you know, it's just it just takes away when you're doing close ups because now all of a sudden it's not high def because, yes. you know, the actress has it in her in her rider that there's no way you can film me the way, you know, I actually am. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, have you seen Timeless? 
on Netflix. No, we discussed that. I, I actually I saw the first episode when it first aired, however many years ago that was. And that was the um, Hindenburg one, right? Yeah. yeah. But so the, I did the woman that in one. that, her, her face from here, from here to just under her eye to just below her nose, in any close up has been, it's, has no features whatsoever. And it's so obvious. <laughs> And I, I need that. I thought I was, I thought, well, don't we all, darling? But uh, I um, here's uh, my filter. Oh, I rather should have said no. Of course not, Shelley. Is the answer? That's fine. It's fine. You. I'm an um, old woman, and I have to accept the fact woman. that I do not look 25 anymore. Come I in. okay have with a it. Cup of coffee with me. I'm okay with it. I'm really okay with it. Yeah, I'm you okay sound with it. it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Jamie Anderson watched the series and I said, am I making this up or have they done some jiggery pokey, pokery with her face? And he went, oh, God, yes, it's obvious. Oh, I mean, they had to do that with Billy Piper. She was quite honest about in in the Christmas special, the first episode with David Tennant, because mm-hmm. she had an enormous spot on her head. Oh, jeez. And so what they did, they say put... she was like 19 years old. How exactly. she gonna... <laughs> I mean, exactly. But, but because oh. she's, you know, and so they, but so they put something out and it was really seriously big, you know, a bit, I think it must have got, I don't know why I'm going into all this detail about, <laughs> must have got infected. It was a big bump. Right. So they put makeup on it to smooth it out, but it still looked like a blind volcano, you know. <laughs> so then they, they had to pay a lot of money to have that all altered. But Billy was quite up front about it i think yeah. she she shot a video in her trailer saying oh there's me with my volcano on my head and all that kind of thing so yeah she's quite down to earth about things like that but yeah so it does happen you know so if it's a pity they couldn't have done it with me in uh, torchwood to you know make me look handsome <laughs> <laughs> well they're doing that with whole characters now there was just a movie that came out uh army of the dead i oh, think yes. it's called with uh yeah. the wrestler guy from yeah yeah I saw David, some of that David Batista. Yeah. They recast one of the characters because the actor who played the role had some uh, issues, let's just say. Okay. Uh, and so they recast him with a uh, with a woman. And all and uh, yeah, if I hadn't known that they had done that, if they hadn't made such a big deal about that they recast this role and, you know, they had to go in and they had to re- refilm certain things, but then other parts they just CGI'd her in. And this, wow. if I hadn't known that, I would have been fine. But let me tell you, the entire movie was me going, oh, yeah, I can see. Oh, yeah, I can tell. Oh, oh, that's his face. That's his, the back of his head, but that's her hand. And, you know, it was just. You know, I only saw the beginning of it and I just decided this isn't for me. But I remember thinking there was something. I mean, there's so much CG in it anyway. Yeah. But, I, I, I but a whole was... human being on. Yeah. Like, it was just crazy that they can do that now. Yeah. yeah. Just deep crazy. Fake. Yeah. Oh, and those don't even get me started about those deep fake videos. Those are mind-boggling that how good they are with the voice that you mean oh just crazy it is incredible isn't it yes. yeah used to be okay. that you could say oh if there's no proof there's no video there's no proof and now it's like oh <laughs> yeah we can prove in inverted we can, commas we can, right right yeah well, yeah. look, that was the emails. Don't forget, folks, do send that. Those were three cracking emails, actually. Yes. Uh, do yes. send some more into podcast at nicholasbriggs.com. Um, I love I love the emails. Shelley usually misses them. I miss you, all of this get, fun yeah. stuff. Well, <laughs> uh, it's, yes. Uh, well, Benji's loss is your gain. <laughs> this is true. So what now? We are talking about Cracker. Which honestly took me way too long to figure out why it was called Cracker. Um, (laughs) So uh, Cracker is a British crime drama, British crime drama series produced by Granada Television for ITV, created and principally written by Jimmy McGovern. Set in Manchester, the series follows a criminal psychologist or quote unquote cracker Uh, Dr. Edward Fitz Fitzgerald, played by Robbie Coltrane who is fantastic, by the way, who works with the Greater Manchester Police to help them solve crimes. And we watched uh, the first episode, which was called, and I have many questions about this, The Mad Woman in the Attic is what Mm. the show is called. Uh, After a young woman is found dead on a train, slashed to death with a razor blade, a criminal psychologist 
Dr. Edward Fitz Fitzgerald, who knew the victim, is hired by the police to help in the investigation. The prime suspect, however, claims to have amnesia, despite Fitz's attempts to crack him. See, cracker. Mm, yeah, I yeah. got that. I well, didn't sort of crack the case, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, crack, cracker. Yeah. 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 Um, it's not. It's not that uh, uh, racist uh, word. No. <laughs> yeah, no. no. It's not. That's not a reference. The American series, I think, was called Fitz, wasn't it? No, it was called Cracker something else. Cracker with like a longer title. Cracker yeah. Jack. They no. changed his first name. Um, I believe it was. Yeah, his name is he, his name is Jerry Fitzgerald instead of Edward Fitzgerald. Not that okay. that makes any difference. But um, I wonder why I think it was something was called Fitz. Maybe there was a book. Who knows? No, no it was still was still called Cracker because that's how I discovered it. Yeah. I was googling to get some information, and that did came you, up. Did you Google Jimmy McGovern? Um, a little bit. We, something just—he's got something that just came out recently. Isn't there a TV show right now that's out that was written by Jimmy McGovern? There's more than likely to be. Because I just saw something and I went, Jimmy McGovern, I know that name. And of course, because my memory is horrendous, it took me forever to figure out why I knew that name. He's um, just written loads of things and he's a very hard hitting writer, um, you know, uncompromising. I mean, he did, yeah, the the uh, docudrama Hillsborough about the death of loads of football fans when they got crushed in a stadium, which starred oh, uh, Christopher Eccleston. Uh, that's a, a real story, you know, it, and has only recently been kind of resolved um, in the courts in, in Britain over the last few years about who was responsible. Uh, what, the street. You know, I'm just trying to see what he's done recently. 23 on Time, written by McGovern. Yes, it's that just started on on Sunday uh, um, on BBC One here, starring Sean Bean. Yeah. There we go. So that's... Yes, I must watch that then. I didn't know it was by Jimmy McGovern. I read about it and thought, I don't fancy that. But now I know it's written by Jimmy McGovern. I might give it a go. Shelley, are you reading or have you just frozen? Well, Shelley seems to have disappeared. I wonder whether she can uh, rejoin <laughs> the podcast. I'm going to write to her. Uh, uh, yeah. Can you rejoin? It's still recording. Yeah, so maybe she'll come back. Who knows? We'll find out. Um, this is uh, going to be interesting in a post-production sense. This could just be a soliloquy by me. I'd just like to mention for those of you not watching the video, and uh, you can only watch the video if you're a Patreon patron subscriber, um, I'm wearing a uh, Scottish hat not interesting but it is true not quite sure why i'm wearing it i was wearing a baseball cap with los angeles written on it before and um the, i bought it when i was in los angeles um for no particular it was very sunny so i needed to protect my head and uh, yeah that's why i bought it and i wear it now because it's the only baseball cap i've got that actually fits me <laughs> Just waiting to see whether Shelley will, will come back in. Possibly not. Nothing I can do because I'm not in control of this Streamyard session. I can't wait for the day that um, Benji uh, gets the internet again so he can uh, help. Uh, maybe I should try uh, Shelley on... Uh, I don't know. My internet went down. Uh, I'll say it's still recording. I can't do anything <laughs> to stop it. Hmm. <laughs> uh. The internet just went out in my neighborhood. Yeah. So. There was a whole load of me talking to myself, waiting, for, hoping you'd come back any minute. Okay, well, let's first of all just go to you, Shelley, with yes. your thoughts. On my Cracker. thoughts. Well, of course, I watched the whole first season because I can't not. Um, <gasps> so you saw Christopher Eccleston die horribly. 
He didn't die at the end of the first season. Oh, whoops. Spoiler! I'm sure he died in the second story. No. Maybe because there was, there was, this was an hour, like an hour and a half. And then there was a second one that was like almost two hours. And then there was a third one. Um, the third one uh, was uh, Chris Fulford was in it. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Camille's husband. Um, oh. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so those were the, I watched the, the first three, which were super duper long. Um, but I absolutely loved it. I thought it's, it's the, the crime. I mean, of course I love, I love anything with crime and, and uh, psychology and figuring out why oh, criminals yeah, yeah. do what they do and you know criminal profiling and all that stuff i just i i'm fascinated by that stuff and so this was a really neat take on it for me as far as the fact that um it's a psychologist and the reason he got involved it wasn't the police didn't reach out to him Man. he knew the vi the second victim she yes. i guess was a student of his he was a, he's right, a teacher yeah. um and so that's how he got involved. So he had a personal connection to it, which made it a little bit more interesting as to why he was a part of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I just I loved the, all the characters. I hated his character because he was just so I mean, just despicable as a human yeah, yeah, being. Yeah. He's this you know drunken, slovenly gambling addict who just his poor wife his poor kids like, yeah, he just yeah. felt so sorry He's for utterly everybody reprehensible isn't he yes yeah. um and i had actually hoped that as i kept watching that i would like him you know that he would maybe kind of have like some character arc where he would redeem himself no not no. not in the ones that i saw he hadn't he just got worse and worse um Yes, he's unlikable, but sort of fascinating. So you, ne you never warm to him, no. but you're still compelled by him, which is yeah. an interesting thing. Oh, and it? he's just, he's so amazing. He yeah. plays it so perfect. He's yeah. just, he's like, you know, it's, yes, you don't like him, but he's just, he's, he's a human. And that's. He doesn't seem to have an ounce of needing to be liked either, does no, he? Which I suppose no. that that's what's for want of a better word a bit appealing about him because when people are needy and want to be loved that can be a bit off-putting yeah well we're both like that actually let's face it <laughs> love me please love me please. um but what i found that. just so I, I loved that it was the whole time you're watching the first episode, you're like, well, of course, it's this guy. This guy did it. Of course, of course, of course. And then, you know, and all the everything that kept happening, you're like, well, that's even more obvious. And then when it turned out, you know, I mean, I, of course, I figured it out as soon as that guy made the phone calls. Like, I'm a priest. So therefore, I'm telling the truth. Yes, and the yes. cops are all like, oh, well, it was a priest. So it must be true. And, the, and he was like, why would you think he was a priest? He called on the phone. Yeah, you, yeah dummies like. yes and he also betrayed a confidence yeah and, you know. <laughs> so um but what, what was interesting for me was the whole time watching this the guy who plays the suspect um kelly tom tom kelly i think was but he looks exact the actor who plays him looks exactly like the actor jamie bell who uh <laughs> won <laughs> Do you know who Jamie Bell is? Yeah, yeah, of course. From uh, Billy Elliot? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I did a side-by-side. -side. Of course, I was obsessed with it. So I went and I found a picture of, of that guy. And then um, I found a picture of Jamie Bell and I put them next to each other. I was like, yep, yep. He's his long-lost father or uncle or It's difficult something. for me to think that because Adrian Dunbar, as is the name mm -hmm. of the actor, has become very, very famous in this country for playing a character in li The Line of Duty, which oh, is okay. a long-running crime yeah. series here, which, is, which has broken all TV ratings, records and everything. It has become the most watched program. Mm -hmm. And the whole nation is it, it bucks the trend of the whole non-linear watching because the BBC show it once a week every Sunday when the series is out and people all tune in to watch it. You can't see the whole series in one go and binge it, which everyone yeah. complains about like mad, but they still, and it's Jed Mercurio, the writer and um, executive producer who's created this compelling and frustrating drama. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Andrew Smith, don't you? Yes. 
Yeah, well, who's an ex-high-ranking police mm -hmm. officer. He can't watch it because he finds it... Because the whole idea about Line of Duty is it's meant <laughs> to be really accurate. And Andrew says it's just all wrong. Everything about it is wrong. But it's dramatic. But anyway, right. that's Adrian Dunbar's... Um, you know, he has become fam much more famous mm -hmm. late in his career for playing that part. Yeah. The name of which I can't think. Everyone's now screaming it at the podcast. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I suppose Jamie yeah. Bell, interesting. Yeah. Well, um, but I just, I really, I liked this. So, since we were kind of doing a theme over the last few podcasts of crime kind of shows, um, I kind of sat down and I thought, you know, comparing this to Jonathan Creek and Bergerac, this just, just above yeah. all, I just loved this. I just really, yeah. I, the, the acting was just amazing. The writing was amazing. Um, Christopher Christopher Eccleston as his cute little baby face <laughs> detective was just he was a, just so fun to watch. He Apparently was brilliant he in it as well. Oh, sorry, God. <laughs> it's a really good storyline as well. Oh God, I can't believe that they left it until the second series. I really thought it happened in the second story. Isn't that weird? No, that's funny. the way I watched it. By the way, this story it was in two episodes. It yeah. wasn't for you. It was oh, no, okay. I. It, that's how they broke it down. Yeah. So, yeah. Because yeah. you, you spoke about it. I thought maybe you had a feature length version of it or something, but no, it was in two distinct episodes. Yes. With, yeah. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's British television that had started to learn from American television. That was the stage. Maybe I think that's it, why I was yeah, a little no, bit totally. more drawn to this. Totally. They, they, because it, it, it fit my palate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even though it's, I think it's, uh, less uh, because of Fitz being so unappealing it's less like American television in that sense but the way it's written the way it's written in a more cinematic fashion mm -hmm. and it's a lot about the visuals and it's quite stylishly made I mean I to be boringly technical I think they shot it on what they call Super 16 so they didn't shoot it in 35mm film but Super 16 I think had one set of sprockets removed so they could make it wider Oh, okay. Because of the celluloid, you know, because the cameras were better at holding the film in place with one set of sprockets. I think I got that right. Anyway, and that's what a lot of British television around that time used because it looked pretty classy. Um, whereas, you know, things like Bergerac look a bit grainy and old mm -hmm. because they were shot on old sort of 16 millimeter stock. Um, I just, really, I don't really know that much about the technical side. Um, <laughs> but anyway, but just the whole. Um, the feel of it and the music and the, the way the characters are built and all the psychology and stuff that's very much learning from from american television and also jimmy mcgovern being an extraordinary writer actually mm -hmm. one of the leading writers on british television and it says something that he's still doing groundbreaking stuff now yeah um but i i remember thinking watching it again my goodness they couldn't make this now because there's so much that's offensive about Fitz. I think I think people just would be offended and that yeah. would be it. The series would get cancelled. People well, are far less tolerant of bad behaviour now, aren't they? Yeah, and one of the things that was, you know, my clutching my pearls as I was watching this, you know, the difference between what can be shown on British television versus what is, can be shown on American television, not only can you not show nipples of female This was during the autopsy scene. Oh, yes, yes. F like, full on, and I was just like, oh, because it's just not something that I'm used to seeing on broadcast television. Obviously, we've got all the streaming stuff now, so that, that they don't follow the same rules. So nipples ahoy on the streaming. Nipples <laughs> Extra extravaganza that's the name of our tv dinners <laughs> got this great pitch for a tv show for uh, netflix it's called nipples <laughs> only <clears throat> the nipples but um it just it was very you know there was a lot about it that was that was like a little ooh for me yeah but yeah. um but yeah, I just, I was, I, and that's why I said, I just kept watching because I, I wanted to see where the characters were. for the went. nipples? Yes, for the nipples. And um, <laughs> it is Pride Month after all. Um, <laughs> so one thing that was, and I don't know if you remember, because you obviously don't remember it because you thought Chris Eccleston's character died already. But the, by the end of the, the last episode of this first series, 
the female detective, uh, what he calls Pan, Pan Handel. Handel. Yeah, 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 she's great. Isn't she? She's like in love with him and mm. she's obsessed with him and trying to get him to go. And I'm like, no, that's just not believable. Like that's a man writing for other mm. men who think that this is something that's realistic. And it's just not. I'm sorry. I mean, it might be he's, but yeah. he's just not a, he, I could see. If because he's, he's big and fat. That's what no, because he's a horrible person. Oh, okay. He's a gambling addict. He treats his family like garbage. His wife asks him for one thing, and that is, don't gamble. Yeah, he's That's addicted. I'll, I, I, just don't gamble, and and you know I'll I'll allow you to keep drinking. I'll allow you to keep being whatever you want to be, but just don't just don't do that one well, thing because it financially ruins the family. Oh my god! Yeah, but. You know, no, but I he's mean, he's addicted, isn't he? He's addicted yeah. to gambling. So yeah. that's it. He's, but you know, she, he, there are options to break addictions, and and he yeah. was too. I don't know what it was that he was like. I can't go to Gamblers Anonymous or whatever the, it's called over there. You know, the the yeah the twelve step programs to help. But um, yeah, because he's too in inverted commas clever. He yeah. thinks he's too clever for it, doesn't yeah. he? And he'll see through it. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing, isn't it, when you see people who you don't think i mean are likely couples and i remember thinking oh they're not going to do that are they and i just hoped we wouldn't see a bedroom scene because i didn't want to see robbie coltrane's nipples um <laughs> or whatever else you know um but so i suppose i'm being um sort of body fascist in in sort of thinking oh it can't work but of course it does work you do see couple, but you yeah. also how many times in your life have you met you know nice people who are having relationships with people who you think are horrible it does happen yeah yeah so so but yeah, yeah it's interesting have you have you got to the bit where she drives and takes her eyes off the road and just looks at him yeah yeah that's terrifying isn't it mm -hmm. well that anyway. terrifies me in any movie or tv show yeah. because you know that i because i used to live in la so i've seen the actual setup when they're filming someone's driving they're on top of a another thing that's pulling them so they're she's yeah. not, they're not actually driving so you know they'll be talking so anyhow la da 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 da, da. but when she deliberately like, <laughs> you know yeah. you know she deliberately does it it's just a really i think that's one of the most powerful scenes in the series where she just turns and looks at him mm -hmm. and he's kind of he, he starts to lose his cool i think she finds it's one of the few ways that she can you know have some power over him because he's always there with the remark yeah. he's always analyzing her yeah. I mean, in that first story, when when he's trying to crack Adrian Dunbar's character, he starts ridiculing her in a really sexist way, all about her upbringing and everything. Mm -hmm. And she's really makes her really uncomfortable. So it's interesting. She ends up yeah. loving him because he's emotionally abused her. But yeah. yeah, we could go down that dark abyss, but we're not going to. <laughs> well, how many exclamation marks are you going to give it, Shelley? I'm going to give it four exclamation yeah. marks because i well, really really enjoyed it well, why is the fifth one missing because it's not perfect to me what's what's the what's the lack of perfection i'm not challenging you because <laughs> you I, are I challenging think, me i, I just, think four as well i just want to yeah. identify one. no i just uh, you know i like to leave a little room for something that can little come along room. that will be you know that that ticks all the boxes for me. I, I there was like I said, some of the issues I did have were it's and I, and I it's I'm starting to sound like this feminist person, but I'm not. Starting I just starting to. <laughs> thank you. Um, but it's, it's just not an that insult. men writing for women. It's mm. it. There's there tends to be a little bit of a disconnect sometimes. Um, but I really, really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed all the characters and the development. The stories were fantastic. Uh, so I really, but, I, but, and it's funny that you mentioned that this is a little bit more Americanized as far as how it all goes. And, yeah. and that's me being a little more attracted to it for that reason. I don't know. Have to talk to my shrink about that. <laughs> well, like... no, but I think it's what the kind of entertainment style that people are used to. I mean, I would say that, um, uh, um, American uh, television and now British television is like this, but American television um, it tells you what you're supposed to be thinking and feeling. Yeah. Whereas older British television left it up to you. They stepped back and, and they didn't make it obvious. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, they were, and you'd think, well, I don't, and watching it now, you think, I don't know where I'm, I don't know who I'm supposed to like. And that, that's what they did. Yeah. They'd, they'd leave it to the audience. Whereas with all the cinematic tricks you can bring to bear with a more expensive production, you can, you can do all sorts of clever things to make the audience think what you want them to think. And that, you know, and that's, that's very much a cinematic thing. Whereas, you know, mm -hmm. the old British style of, um, uh, 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 just, you know, putting people in a studio and having three cameras shoot them in quite wide shots a lot of the time left a lot more to the audience's mind, I think. Also, uh, just the way it was, stuff was written before. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were really allergic to Z cars, weren't you? You know, and I think that was kind of, that was yeah. the raw version of old British television yeah. that sort of, you know, I showed, in my defense, I would... Things. I would like to see Zed cars on a cleaner, more visually appealing yeah. and auditorily appealing. Because watching it the way I watched it, it was dark, it was fuzzy, and and the audio wasn't great. And no, you know, I'm, there, there. There's always going to be an issue when the accents are a little bit more regional oh, than were, your yeah, standard British English. You know, so that I did have a little hard time while watching that catching yeah, everything that, yeah and that's generally a problem but i'm sure it's the same with british people with you know particular regional accents mm -hmm. in america i mean you know there are some americans i mean i had to watch battlestar galactica with subtitles on because everyone seemed to be mumbling all the time because they were they were you know they weren't forming their words as clearly as mm -hmm. perhaps i might have liked it and because the accent was different for me yeah so yeah that that is the thing i mean zed cars by the by just becomes quite dull and dry but it was right at the beginning there where nothing like that had ever been mm -hmm. made and you know they and they did things like showing i mean values were different there but they did things like showing uh marital abuse and they didn't tell you what to think about it they just left it and you're thinking am i supposed to like these people am i supposed to and you found that quite disorientating uh -huh. and it is disorientating <laughs> um but that's what they used to do in those days whereas now they make a drama and they have a point to it and they tell you what to think and they you know i I'm, I'm sounding like i disapprove of that i do i mean yeah. i think it's a good thing for drama to know what it's about and what mm -hmm. it, what what it hopes the audience will get from it anyway yeah four four exclamation marks for me too because uh, because because i found it a bit uncomfortable because yeah. he's so offensive yeah and even though that was sort of more fun back in the day, now I just think, ouch. Yeah. I don't know. They they just couldn't make it now. And I don't know whether that's a good or a bad thing, but they just couldn't yeah, make it. Yeah, he would right his now. that character would definitely be watered down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Literally, he'd be drinking less, probably. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, when he was on that uh, train and he's saying about oh, was he on the train? I can't remember, but it was about the smoking and the drinking, because and he says, Cause I like it. Yeah. I like it. And I think back in the day, that was more like, hey, hey, yeah, we thought, yeah, it's bad, but you know. Yeah. But, but now you watch it and you just think, well, you idiot. Yeah. You're just an idiot. Why are you destroying yourself and your life and those that, you know. Well, they did bring sensitive. it up with the, when the, he was taking the taxi cab home and he was smoking in the car and the yeah. taxi driver was like, no, you can't smoke in here. And he like even he spouted off these statistics. So they say, well, I it, it, they've studied and they've learned that twenty percent of blah blah blah. And I was just like, oh, that was I was shocked by that. Yeah. And then you know, so he was just at that point like, no, no, not going to care. I don't care. You know, absolutely. But again, you see, that was before the smoking ban. Mm -hmm. It was when people. I always remember there was a film. Um, Death on Long Island, I think it might have been called, with John Hurt. It was a very low-budget film he made. Um, and when he gets in a cab, uh, he smokes. I th this is before he goes to Long Island. He's in London. And the driver says, uh, it says no smoking. He says, no, it doesn't. It says, thank you for not smoking. But I'm smoking, so there's no need to thank me. <laughs> <laughs> just light up uh, anyway anyway yeah. so there we go yes um colin smith our esteemed artist has demanded <laughs> that next can't imagine time, why yeah <clears throat> because time he's crunch. done the cover <laughs> he's done the cover and there's a little little less time this week uh that we do the final part of inferno's um commentary you okay so with that's that? episode 65 <laughs> is that what that episode is <laughs> 952, I think you'll find. Yeah. <laughs> Episode 7 of Inferno. Oh, uh, yay! Uh, yay! 
Oh, Shelley's internet is rubbish today. Hi. Hello. So I... we just got to the end, hadn't we, really? Yeah. We don't have to... No. We said we were going to watch. Uh... Yeah, we've done all that. Yeah. So, so um, any final business before we uh, depart? Uh, just want to say, if you're looking to buy some Benji and Nick show merchandise, you're going to want to go to nicholasbriggs.com forward slash shop. And there's a U.S. shop and there's a uh, rest of the world shop. So, um, yeah, T-shirts and mugs currently and possibly some other stuff coming soon. And if you are watching the video, uh, let's just see the mug again. Oh, the mug. Dun, dun. <laughs> One of the mugs. The Benji and Nick show mug. And if you're not watching the video, that was very frustrating for you. I thought you could make a slurping noise at least. You're so ladylike. <laughs> Hold on, I can't make a slurping noise. I can't make a slurping noise. You, what, it's you're physically too, impossible. You're so polite. I can make one without any liquid in my glass. Listen. Yeah. There, you see, you can do it. I was afraid I was going to choke on it. I think that's I've what just it was. I've just taught Shelley Dean bad <laughs> manners. Well done. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, that's it. That's from from uh, That's it. Nick B. It's good B close to the microphone. <laughs> We're so discombobulated oh, today. Know what's oh, going on? It's been a nightmare. Sanity. Um, and this is from me, Shelley Dean. Goodbye. And Shelley Dean will now be pressing stop. Could you? I'm pressing stop now.